Since Crusader 2 is now finally a finished game, I'll do a quick ranking of all the DLCs that are commercially available for it. The first DLC was Sword of Islam, and basically just allowed you to play as a Muslim ruler, so just for that, I'll put it in the A section. The second DLC that was released is Legacy of Rome, and it gives you a couple of things like forming the Roman Empire, but the most important benefit is the ability to have retinues. With the retinues, the standing army you get is such a strong advantage. Not having it is really like setting you back a lot. So just for that, it'll go in the S section. The next DLC was Sunset Invasion. And the only thing Sunset Invasion did was to add the Aztec attacking like the Mongols, but from the West and with rabies and with weird stuff and everything. Basically, it was such an historical DLC that I don't think anybody plays with it on. And if you forget it on during a multiplayer game, you're just gonna waste a lot of time for nothing for everybody. It deserves to go in the D section. The fourth DLC that was released is the Republic. And it grants you the ability to play as a merchant Republic. So either Venice or any of the Anseatic League members. And it gives you a very nice way to spend some time trying to wrestle with the other families that are trying to fight for the control of the nation. Once you have played it once, it's not really that interesting to go in unless you really want the achievements. So for that, I'll put it in the C section. The fifth DLC that was released is The Old Gods. And it's one of the best DLC in my opinion in the game because notably it allows you to play as the Zoroastrian, which I think is the religion that makes CK2 CK2. It also lets you play with the Vikings, which is a lot of fun to play with, just raiding around, looting stuff from the Christians. One of the best thing in the game to do. And I think it fairly deserved the A section. The sixth DLC was Sons of Abraham. It basically lets you play as a Jew or have some Jewish courtiers and you can take loans from Jews and expose like, these Jews to forgive the loan and take even more money and also lets you beg money from the Pope. It quickly becomes like a background DLC after a while so I think it goes with the Republic in the C section. The seventh released DLC is Rajas of India. I'll put it in the D section because quite honestly, while I have it since almost release, I never really played in India except when trying a random ruler and it never really lasts that long. I, after all, I'm playing Crusader Kings 2 and not Mujahideen Raja 2. The eighth released DLC is Charlemagne. And I think Charlemagne is the greatest DLC of CK2. And the main reasons is that it adds 100 extra years to the early start date of the Old Gods DLC. In that 100 years extra, you get very nice starts like Charlemagne himself, or in the East, for Zoroastrianism, you have the Pavendit dynasty. But simply the extra time you get to play the game is enough for me to put it firmly in the S section. The ninth DLC that was released is Way of Life. And it simply gives you so much more to do during peacetime that it actually makes the game enjoyable to not always be at war. So just for that extra fun, I'll put it in the S section. The tenth released DLC is Horse Lords. And it gives you some fun to do with Tangri Step Riders, Horse Riders, I can raise everything on their path, but it also adds goddamn freaking adventurers that will just amass huge armies and try to conquer your land for no reason. So for that, I'll put it right in the middle in the B section. The 11th released DLC is the Conclave. And the Conclave just adds the cancel to the game. And while it can be quite fairly annoying most of the time, it's also kind of easy to cheese if you just grant this royalties to females because they don't actually require to see it on the console and you can just put puppets everywhere. 
otherwise you just need to deal with irating vassals. Before that, I'll settle it right next to the Republics and Son of Abraham. The 12th DLC is the Reaper's Dew. It adds contagious disease that you can fight with lockdown and quarantines. And due to the current life situation, I'll sit it in the B section. The 13th DLC of Crusader Kings 2 was Monks and Mystics. It has secret society so you can become a satanist or a hashish smoker, but not both at the same time. I'll sit it into the C section because while interesting these secret societies, they kind of take a back burner most of the time because if you want to go high in a secret society, you need to invest a lot of time in it and it kind of get grindy after a while. The 14th DLC is Jade Dragon and what it incorporates is the influence of China. So while not actually on the map, the Chinese Empire can still have an impact by trading with you, sending you courtiers, or literally invading your entire land if you're close enough to them to do so. And it deserved the C for China section. Because saying C section is not quite the abortion this DLC is. This one is life for real, and sometimes you forget about it. The 15th DLC is Holy Fury. And what I like about it is that it represents the final version of Crusader Kings 2. Crusader Kings 2 will forever be what Holy Fury is. And I love it for that. So this one deserves the S section because it's an excellent DLC to close this game. Oh, please don't get too mad if you think I misrated some DLC. I'm just doing that for fun. And anyway, if you really want to buy a DLC, I think you should just wait for the full package on sale sometime soon. Probably when CK3 will come out. Hopefully you've enjoyed this quick tier list. And if you did, make sure to subscribe for more. Thank you for watching and see you next time.